Hello and welcome to Onward, the Funrise podcast, where you can find out more about what's happening at Funrise and where you'll hear in-depth conversations about the big trends affecting the U.S. and global economies. My name is Ben Miller. I am CEO and co-founder of Funrise. Before we get started, I want to remind you that this podcast is not investment advice. It is intended for information and entertainment purposes only. We have a special guest today, Larry Silverstein. At 91 years of age, Larry Silverstein is well known throughout the world as the owner, developer of the World Trade Center in New York. Born during the Great Depression, Larry started from humble beginnings in New York where he would grow up. He is chairman of Silverstein Properties that has developed, owned, and managed more than 40 million square feet of office, residential, hotels, and retail. The firm currently has over $10 billion worth of development underway. Larry purchased the World Trade Center building only six weeks before September 11th, and then he spent the following 21 years rebuilding the World Trade Center site, a $30 billion project. He is a legend in the industry. So without further ado, Larry Silverstein. Thanks for joining me. Welcome to Onward. Good to be here. So on October 29th, 1975, President Ford declared, quote, he would veto any bill calling for a federal bailout of New York City. And he instead proposed legislation that would make it easier for the city to go bankrupt. These days, most people don't know that New York had such a rough time of it with crime, unemployment. The city had cut trash collections, so the trash was piling up. Apparently, if New York went bankrupt, they would have to shut down public schools. On July 13th, 1977, there was a blackout and widespread looting. So in the midst of all this, the summer of 1977, you purchase 711 Fifth Avenue, 350,000 square foot Art Deco building from the 1920s for $14 million. What were you thinking? Hard to remember today, all the details back then. But what I can say is, 7-Eleven was then owned by Columbia Pictures. Cy Malamud was the treasurer of the organization, the financial caregiver. I remember reading that they were having financial difficulties, Columbia Pictures, and therefore what I thought I heard was their interest in potential self the built Magnificent location, Fifth Avenue, the corner of 55th Street. It was a quality building in a superb Fifth Avenue location. Superb. You couldn't get a better location for a building in the 50s, the upper 50s on Fifth Avenue. And here was Fifth Avenue, corner, substantial, significant. And I remember looking at that building and saying to myself, wow, how do we buy that tip? Of course, all kinds of problems of it. Mm -hmm. The city was great financial difficulty. The Beam administration, they called, they needed to get the real estate owners, the real estate developers to prepay the real estate taxes. So if they had enough money to meet Friday afternoon payroll of the police department, the fire department, municipal workers, so forth, they had the money. So I remember getting Larude and getting on the phone, calling all of us. Because at that time, he was like the titular head of Associated for a Better New York. Well, we all got together, recognized the city desperately needed help in every dimension. But that outstanding, I said, okay, what a hell of a building. What an opportunity to buy this thing and to buy it right. I started thinking about how best to do this and decided to make an offer. So I remember sitting with Cy Malamud, the treasurer, chief financial officer or whatever, and proposing to buy the building, I think, what was the price around? 14, 14 million. 14 million. And as I recall it, I think that I offered two and a half million cash. And the balance was a purchase money mortgage that he was going to take because interest rates at that time were going crazy. Everything was going nuts. So the only way I could achieve financing for this thing was if he took back a mortgage and I think the interest rates we asked for and got was somewhere five to seven. So it was from that vantage point, terrific as an opportunity to buy it. 
fine, shook hands, started preparing contracts. And then all of a sudden, no contract. So I called Sai, I said, where's the contract? He said, well, we have another walker. So I started saying, I said, who the hell, who's out there? Crazy as I am, I supplied this building. So, so I remember a day or two later, going up the escalator at the Hilton Hotel, and I see George Kaufman coming down the escalator. And suddenly I said to myself, I said, George, he said, hey, Larry, we knew each other. I said, stop at the bottom, I'll come back down. I turned around, came back down. I said, George, are you by any chance trying to buy a 7 Eleven Fifth Avenue? He looks at me, he says, did you know? I said, take a wild guess. So we sat there, talked for a few minutes. I said, George, instead of competing with Jeff, let's buy it together. Okay. So we arranged that he would drop out and that I would negotiate the deal for the two of us. That's exactly what happened. Came back to Cy Mel and I said, Cy, I'm ready to close. I want to buy this place. Okay, we'll get you the contract. Then all of a sudden, went quiet again. I called. I said, what happened to the contract? He said, there's another boss. So I said to us, who the hell is it this time? I remember calling George, telling him what the circumstances are. He said, Larry, who do you think it is? I said, I think I might have an idea. So hung up with George, put in a call to Richard. I said, Richard, are you trying to buy 7 Eleven to have you? He said, how'd you know? Hey, Richard who? Richard Bernstein. He said, got a partner on the deal. I said, you want a partner? I got a partner. That... So it was Peter Feinberg. Everybody knew everybody. That's yeah, right. So what we finally decided to do, instead of competing with each other, the four of us would buy it. And went through the same thing. I said, you guys drop out. I'll negotiate the deal for all of us and so on. And that's exactly what happened. Everybody dropped out. Simon Mellon had finally said, okay, I'll send you the contract. I said, do you mean it this time? I said, yeah, this time I mean it. So we bought the building and it was a tough time. The economy was bad shape. The city was in terrible shape. And everybody said, why are you doing this? It doesn't make sense. I said, well, we stole the building. I mean, we really bought it very right. And the conditions under which we bought it, purchase money, mortgage, financing, very good terms, long term. I said to myself, this is the kind of property to buy and hold long term. Don't think in terms of a quick flip or anything like that. I said, the real value here is holding on to this thing because ultimately this location is so good, it's going to sink and the rental values will go up. The retail values will rise. It's just such a positive location. So it didn't take long before Columbia Pictures was acquired by Coca-Cola. Now, Coca-Cola had two things. It had syrup and money, huge amounts of cash. And it wasn't long before I got a phone call from Coca-Cola. And they said, we want to buy the building back. I said, it's not for sale. That's done an interesting pursuit by them and negotiations by me on behalf of the group. And ultimately, it got to such a point where I remember Richard Bernstein, Josh Kaufler, and Peter Feimer. They said, listen, this is such a crazy price they're offering us. I mean, how do we say no? I said, because this building is going to be worth a hell of a lot more than even they're offering us that. It only is going to go one direction. Nevertheless, it took them a while to convince me. And while they were convincing me, I kept raising price <laughs> with Coca-Cola. Ultimately, we sold to Coke. It was a very successful investment. Yeah, I have the numbers here. So you bought it for $14 million. They took back $11.5 million mortgage. So you put in $4 or $5 million. You sold it for $57.6 million six years later. So I think that's a 20 times in six years. But then you were right again because it sold in October 2019 for $909 million. Yeah. Early on, it just seemed to me the smartest thing to do was to buy well-located real estate, but with long-term holds as the direction. Of course, the values would only increase with time, would go only in one direction. Because I felt that New York was 
and difficulty, lots of financial difficulty. But ultimately, we get straightened out. And the banks took over in New York. And then Felix Roden came in to head the municipal financial, I forget exactly what it was called, but essentially the banks took control of the city. And then, God bless him, Hugh Carey, the governor of the state of New York, ultimately pledged the full faith and credit of the state for the city and stopped the bankruptcy proceedings from going forward. He saved the city. Took huge courage on behalf of Governor Carey to do that. But it was only the right thing to do because then after that, the city came back and died to us. Okay, so let's segue to the next era, next crisis, next building. It's funny, I look at the buildings you bought and each property is like the story of New York encapsulated. This time, 1980, 120 Wall Street. So you buy a 615,000 square foot building on Wall Street for $12 million, which is $19.50 a square foot, which is the same amount it cost to build it in 1929. Put that in perspective. So in 2021, the average New York office building sold for $990 a square foot. And you still own it today. And just to tee this up for you, at the start of the SNL crisis, you own Park Avenue Court, a Plaza, Seven World Trade Center, the Equitable Building, and 120 Broadway. And then you go into the worst commercial real estate crisis in American history. I would love to hear your experience from that period. Again tough times. But whatever I did, my perspective was always long-term hold. Just buy it, keep it, and let the value increase with time. So the key was, if you could get it, if it was timely, where interest rates were moderate, buy it, finance it. Obviously, if you can get purchase money financing from the seller, that's the best. But if you couldn't, there were times you couldn't. So you had to go out to the boat to find it mortgage market and finance. But I recognized that over leveraging, getting 75%, 80% financing, sometimes 85%, more. sometimes purchasers would buy subject to a first mortgage that they got from an institution, then put a second mortgage on the property. So there's a third mortgage on it. Right to finance well all the way up. And so they came in with a very small amount of cash, but then the building was over leveraged. Any kind of problem that they ran into They was being foreclosed out of the deal. Made no sense to do that. That's not the way to do anything from a long-term perspective. I didn't believe in that. I said to myself, first mortgage financing, nothing more than that ever. Forget about second, third mortgages, just come in with more cash. And sometimes come with more cash was not easy. So sometimes you brought a financial part with you. So there were always insurance companies that wanted to do deals with us and come in together. So we'd end up negotiating the deal on behalf of ourselves and the insurance company as a financial part. But they had the same long-term goal. And where they didn't, I said, okay, when you want to sell, if you want to sell and I don't, I said, give me the opportunity buying you out, whatever the fair market value is at that time that you want to buy. If I had the cash, I'd buy them out. If I didn't have the cash, I'd find another financial part, come in, stay with me and buy them out. It was the opportunity to hold on for a better market. What we were able to do is improve the buildings. So I remember 120 Wall Street, when we came in and bought it, it was poor shape. And the one thing about it was that the views of the East River were spectacular. Every single war had gorgeous views of the East River. To the north, to the east, and to the south. The space is spectacular. And so we didn't have much difficulty in renting the space and keeping it rented pretty good values. And so we were there at the time that real estate on Wall Street suddenly moved upward. The rents went from about $10 a foot to damn close to $20 a foot in a very short time frame because Wall Street transactions were beginning to increase very significantly. The volume of stock transactions on Wall Street increased to a degree that Wall Street was beginning to have difficulty in managing the flow. But that was a time of 
enormous economic expansion. Things in New York were really going to the roof. And if you could just hold on, you could do very, very well. We did at the right place at the right time with the right products, never overfinanced. We were able to take advantage of a market that was rising significantly. So 120 Wall Street turned out to be a very good, very good product. I think at that time we also bought 120 Broadway. 120 Broadway was a square block property. And we bought that from Harry Helmsley and Larry Wheat. They had put it together as a syndicate years ago, years earlier. I was able to come in and buy it. Turned out to be a terrific long-term hold. We still own it since we bought it in 1980. I think we bought both bills in 1980, 120 Wall, 120 Broadway. And I think we also had bid successfully for the Keystone site at the World Trade Center. Seven World Trade Center. So that's right. when we decided to try to build. You didn't want me to go into that one. Let me just do a quick flashback because oh. you touched it and I wanted to touch it for a moment, <laughs> which is a flashback to 1957 when Harry Helmsley, Lawrence Wien, who you just mentioned, they purchased the Empire State Building. Yes, the Empire State Building. With Bill. 5,000 investors who each put up $5,000. Yes. Become a limited part in the ownership of the Empire State Building. $25 million from 5,000 people at $5,000 each. And you saw that. Yeah. And I said to myself, what a way to go. <laughs> As a result of reading about their acquisition of the Empire State Building, I remember saying to my father, I said, Dad, I want to be an owner. We've got to become owners. And this business of being broke is terrible. So I said, let's buy real estate. So he said, but we have no money. I said, I know we have no money, but look what he did. They didn't have money either, but they bought the Empire State Building. I said, let's do something. So he said, do you think you could figure it out, understand the deal? I said, I'll try. So I got the material from the lean and healthy interests, the brochure. We ended up purchasing our first building at 220 23rd Street. It was a 600000 dollar acquisition of a crummy building in terrible shape in a location that was really tertiary at the time. It was on East 23rd Street. There was nothing good about it. Nothing good about the location. Nothing good about the building. Ton of vacancy. Dirty. Poorly maintained by a Mrs. Strack who owned the building. And I remember asking, would you like to sell it? And she said, yes. So I said, okay, I'd like to buy. So she said, okay, I'll give you the contract to buy the building, but you have to give me $15,000 as a deposit. So I'm going to come back to my dad and said, dad, you got to find 15000 I said, he said, we don't have it. I said, so let's try to borrow it. We started going to banks and every bank we went into said, do you have collateral? I said, if we had collateral, we wouldn't be here. I said, we just need to borrow $15,000 so we could buy this building. Every single bank we went into, bank after bank, went to all of them. None of them would consider it. Until we walked into the public national bank at 85 Delancey Street, the Lower East Side of Manhattan. Remember walking to that place, Bill Green introduces us to him. He was the manager of the bank. He said, how can I help? I said, we want to borrow $15,000. He said, do you have a collateral? I said, no. He said, but what do you want it for? I said, we want to buy this building. He said, tell me about it. So I took out some papers showed him the deal and so forth. And finally he looked at me and he said, okay, takes out a piece of paper, says, sign it. I said, what is it? He said, it's a promissory note. I said, you're going to give us the money? He said, yeah. I said, no, to what? So staggered by the fact that he was finally a bank that would lend us $15,000. He said, you're going to assign the contract to me, to the bank, and that's your collateral. We're going to use that as your collateral for $15,000. I said, this is from heaven. So I remember putting down the $15,000. And then he said, the purchase price is $600,000 for place. So I said, where are you going to get the money? Where are you going to get the rest of it? I said, I don't have a clue. What do you think, Chess? <laughs> he said, get yourself a mortgage. I said, well, could you give us a mortgage? He said, we don't do that. He said, we're a commercial bank. He said, go to a savings bank. Go to a savings bank on 23rd. So I remember going to walk down 23rd Street to find a savings bank. Broadway Savings Bank, sure enough, went in there. Norman Ramsey was the mortgage officer at that time. He agreed to lend us 
$350,000 as a first mortgage on this real estate. So the push was how to raise $250,000, the balance mm-hmm. of the $600,000 purchase price, how to raise $250,000. I said to my partner, I said, Dad, who do you know who we can go to? We need to find 25 investors, of which you put in 10,000 of us, become a limited part in the ownership of the 20 centers. Fortunately, he had lease spaces too as a real estate broker. So we went to each one of those people, he released some space, and they gave us $10,000 each to become an investor in this bill. We had up being able to pay them 1% a month, 4% a year. And it worked out spectacularly well. So well that they all came to say, doing, let's find another building. So we can, the first building was 600, the second building was a million three, a million four. Then the third building was three million six, the fourth building was four million seven. I kept bigger and bigger, bigger. Then the banks that would never lend us the 15,000, they suddenly called and they said, you don't have to go out there, investors anymore. We'll give you whatever you need. Tell us what you need. I will give it to you. And that made us a sea change in our lives. And things really begin to explode after that. I'm a little bit familiar with this experience. When we started Fundrise, it's a real estate technology platform for investment. Do you know how many investors we have in our real estate? 385,000. We did what you said, you did, and we have $3.25 billion of equity and $7 billion of real estate. We started with the first investment, 325,000, we raised 100,000, then we raised the next one, the next one, next one. And 10 years later, it was so uncannily similar, but I know in the beginning, everybody told me I was crazy. I know exactly what you're talking about. So you were crazy. Yeah. You were both crazy. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> I want to talk about World Trade Center, but maybe we could start with Seven World Trade Center. So life was and is and will always be very unpredictable. And you never know where opportunities are going to surface unless you're out there in the middle of it looking for opportunities. We were the high bidder of the site, the Keystone site. What the port had done is they built a Con Ed substation. Our station. Yeah. And they built a foundation for a million square foot building, 40 stories, 25,000 feet out of the floor. So I remember when I signed the deal, with the Port Authority. First guy I called was Jim Boise, a very good friend, J.P. Moore. And I remember walking in and said, Jim, I've got the right to build a million feet, 25,000 foot floors, 40 stories. Can you use it? He said, what's the size of the site? I said, the 53 or 54,000 square foot site. I said, but well, we can't build out the whole thing because it's a Con Ed substation down there. He said, I can use a million feet, but I really use two million feet. He said, can you ban the building? I remember looking, <laughs> absolutely stuck. I said, oh, I'm from leaving his office, going right back down to the trade center, the Port Authority. I said, guys, I got the use of two million feet. How do we expand the building? He said, you can't. Why? Because the substation is there and that provides all the electricity below the net. So I said, okay. So he said, you can't do it. Con Ed will never allow it. Con Ed won't allow it. We at the port is up. They won't. You just got to stay with the me. I said, you know what? Come with me. We're going to Con Ed. I remember walking to the chairman, Chuck Loose, was his name at the time. He was chairman of the board of Con Edison. I told him what we wanted to accomplish. And he said, number one, you don't have enough money to protect us in the event you're putting a new foundation on that site. Back to the lights of all the flow. He said, if that goes out, you're dead and we're dead. We couldn't possibly allow you to do it. He said, by the way, are we suing you? So I looked at him and I said, as a matter of fact, you are. He said, you're putting in a co-generation plant and you're building it up was 40 seconds. I said, yes. He said, well, that's illegal. I said, sir, in all due deference, it's, he said, what do we say? Costly, we're the only ones allowed to provide for electricity city no. I said, yes, but we're not using it to provide for electricity with people in New York. We're just using it to provide electricity. But and it's in our building, no other building, just us. I said, the federal government is encouraging us to do it. They're giving us all kinds of tax benefits. So they think this is important. 
And just at that time, coal generation was everybody. So we said, we're going to try it. And we did. And we beat them in court. But I don't recall how, with all of that, I was able to convince the chairman of Con Edison to allow us to eliminate one pile at a time to replace it with a bigger pile to handle a two million square foot building instead of a million square foot building. With the understanding that if anything went wrong, that was it. It had to stop. I went back to Con Edison. Everybody who was involved with me at that time, including Chuck, they're all dead. They're all gone. And I couldn't really determine what enabled me to convince the chairman of Congress and to allow us to do a test. Nevertheless, he did the first pile. Remember, to a one at a time, and it worked. So that was second, third, fourth. One at a time. And by the time I got finished, we had piles in place for a two million swim. And that's what we built. But by the time we got stunned, Jim Boise and Koch, the mayor of the city of New York, got into a tiff over something. I don't know what it was. And J.P. Morgan decided to take two million square foot function and move it to Delaware. So I know what and it took two million feet. But I still succeeded in going back to Chase to borrow $300 million, guarantee. But the deal I made with them was that as I built the building, floor by floor by floor by floor, no tenants, my exposure would decline and it would hold some out. So as I kept borrowing, put in the floor, kept going higher and higher, my exposure to the guarantee diminished to the point where I had the building they finished, 100% vacant, <laughs> my obligations completely. But I found a user and that user was Solomon Brothers. And I remember negotiating a deal with them and they said, we'd like the building to take a million feet. No, a million feet, Solomon Brothers, major tenant at time, mm-hmm. piece, the building with lease, the balance would lease up quick. The problem was, while we were negotiating the transaction, Boston Properties, I forget his name, came in and showed the design from a building that he was going to build up a Columbus Circle. Showed it to John Goodfriend, the CEO of Solomon. And John Goodfriend called me one day and said, we're not going to take the space. We're moving up instead. We're going up there. And I said, you know, you're going to pay twice the rent up there than you're paying to me. He said, Larry, I know that. He said, but we're making so much money. So make, we could pay the rent, even though it's double what we pay to you. And he said, in addition to which, when I was in high school, I was selling ice cream on that corner of Columbus. At which point I said to myself, you cannot reason with emotion. The guy was emotionally attached to that building uptown. So I remember coming up and saying to my wife, I said, sweetheart, we just lost a million square foot. She said, don't worry. You're going to land on your feet. You always do something better. will come alone. So, so. <laughs> her mouth to God's ears. And sure enough, within a matter of a couple of weeks, got a call from Drexel Burnham. Drexel Burnham. They said, would you come down to make a presentation? Said, sure. Went down, make the presentation. They came back to me and they said, we like the building. We'll take it. I said, how much? She said, the whole book. I said, pull me your feet. I couldn't lease the building for 20 years. Touch no. It was such an incredible change from being down the dumps because we lost a million feet with Sally. These guys covered a lot, too many of them. And by this time, the building was pretty much there. So I remember coming home and telling my wife, I said, sweetheart, how did you know? <laughs> but then just before the signing, the final agreements with Trexel, the telephones went dead and I knew something was wrong. I didn't know what. So I started making some calls, including Bill Butcher, the chairman of Chase. And I said, Bill, the phones have suddenly gone dead. I said, can you find out what's going on? Because he let me free on it. Oh, it's Bill, Bill, Bill. Sure enough, he called me back and said, Larry, there's a real problem here. They're not going to sign with you. Because they can't sign with anybody. Ivan Bost turned state's evidence against Mike Milton. Mike Milton was the guy behind Drexel. And when that deal went dead, I remember coming home, I said, sweetheart, we've lost two million versus a million dollars to me, and we got to finish building. I said, what are we going to do? 
Just at that time, Kennedy's wife, Jackie Onassis, was threatening to sue Boston Properties for putting up this office building at Columbus Circle that was going to cast shadows on Central Park. And suddenly became obvious to Solomon Brothers that they were never going to occupy that building. So I remember John Woodfriend, who was the CEO of South, calling me one day and he said, would you talk to me again? I said, I don't know. It took us about a week and a half to sign Solomon Brothers back into the building. But for a million, 300,000 people, turned out to be a huge success. And that's how we built our first two million square foot building. That's the experience of a developer. Yeah. Everything's always going up, wrong. Up, down, up, down. <laughs> yeah, yep, yep. Let's talk about the World Trade Center on uh, 9-11. We took title to the Trade Center six weeks before mm -hmm. 9-11. So every business day in that six-week period, I'd make an appointment with one of the major space occupants at the Trade Center because the whole transaction focused on the fact that there were 40 tenants, four zero tenants, to buy 7 million feet of space wow. in the Trade Center. And all those leases were coming up in the next three or four years. Huge opportunity for raising the rents. They were paying this. They're paying about $35 a foot. And for buildings that went 110 stories where the views were extraordinary, for really extraordinary views, I said to myself, this space is a hell of a lot more. So that's what motivated purchasing the rates. Then, of course, 9 11. And I remember getting dressed to go to work today. And my wife said, you can't go. And I said, why not? She said, because I'm in the point for the dermatologist. I'd call it here, fair skin, went to the dermatologist every month. Of course, she constantly found close to the sun for me is just terrible. So skin cancers, that was the big issue. She said, you got to go. I made the appointment for it. Sarah, you must go. I said, sweetie, I'll, I'll cancel today. I'll go next month. She said, you canceled last month and you canceled the month can't cancel again. You've got to go. At that point, we were married 45 years. And with your wife gets upset. <laughs> and you got a 45-year relationship. You said, okay, well, don't get excited. Don't get excited. Whatever you want me to, I'll do, but just don't get excited. She said, my life, simple. Just that simple. Never made it to the trade center. But we had two kids on their way down to temporary offices that we were Occupying space in the trade set because we were building our new offices down. Fortunately, the first plane struck at about a quarter of nine. If it struck by nine o'clock, oh, yeah. So we got lucky in that regard. So my kids were okay. We lost four men, four of our employees at the trade center with a total of six or eight kids or something. Got very lucky. Because my life was spared and the two of my kids' lives were spared. So then the question of, okay, what do you do? I told my wife, I said, well, we got the trades. I said, you know, sweet, everything kept postponing, kept postponing. Because there was always another deal, another opportunity. So when the trade center surfaced, I said, we got a shot. Because we're the only non-public entity in the competition. Even though our bid of 3.2 billion was surpassed by Florinino's bid of 2.35 billion. There was $50 million mm -hmm. higher than $50 million on a $3.2 billion bid. It's just around the yard. This doesn't mean anything. The problem was, as a public entity, they could not see themselves acceding to the demands of the trade center, of the Port Authority. Remember, when I learned that Steve is not going to close the deal, I remember calling him and said, what the hell that? And he said, I can't do these things that they want me to do. I just can't do them. I said, such as? He told me the various things supported the question of him. By this time, we had a 20-year relation with the Port Authority, the original seven world trades. They asked me to do all that stuff. And I said, of course, it was easy. I had no problem. On your private, no problem. Public, major problems. So Steve said, I'm out of it. Go ahead, it's yours. Right. Steve Roth. Yeah, Steve Roth. So I remember sitting with my wife and saying, sweetheart, I promise you, you want to 
go around, build another Modi Act or a travel or whatever you want to do. The kids are provided for. We have enough. We don't need anything else. Our lives set. So whatever you want to do. Or I said, we could rebuild the trade center. I can't do this without you. Of course, it's going to take the next 10 years. First, take them 22 years. By the end of the day, she said, you know, you're not going to be happy doing anything else with your life. So let's get on with rebuilding the trades. Must have been the most difficult development yeah. in the world yeah. ever. Yeah, no question. It was grueling. Just for example, we paid huge premiums to 22 insurers to insure the buildings. The one thing became obvious is that you pay huge premiums for that. All you could done is you bought the right to sue the insurers because no way in hell are they going to pay. So it took five years of litigation, $200 million of legal fees to win and get them to pay it. It was crazy. And then the port of there, and the different governors, the different mayors, executive directors, every time another elected official would take off, just stop, stop everything. I want to be sure that you're doing the right. You go into a high rise, there's no way to stop. It was a brutal experience. But the key is when everybody told us we'd never make it, we did it. So to wind up here, we're going into another recession. Seems pretty obvious at this point. There's millions of people who haven't been through a recession because there hasn't been one in almost 15 years. So do you have any enduring lessons? I've been through 2025 horrendous times, financially and otherwise, all kinds of problems. And we made it through every single one. And here, the world told us, don't ever succeed. So don't waste your time. Do something else we'd like. Go with your wife, build a body, do whatever you want. But what I've seen is that Nero comes back every time, bigger and better and stronger than that. I don't think this is going to be any different. So sure, we're going through problems. Yes, of course we are. Is it the end of the world? I don't think so. Provided you have an over leveraged commodity, properly financed. So we're in the process of getting power to built. And that's the last tower of the trades. It's a three million foot building, five billion dollar project. Way to get financing for a five billion dollar project today. Good <laughs> so you have to begin to become creative in your thinking. But I do believe that when this building is finished in 2029, there will be tenancies who are going to need the space because they're in buildings today that are 70, 75, 80 years old. And those buildings don't work for them anymore. They've got to get the hell out of those buildings into modern buildings today because of their needs. So end of days, I think we can fill a three billion square foot building. And I think we'll be able to find the finance with which to build a three billion square foot building. So we're working with Tails or to accomplish exactly this. The other thing is we have agreed with Brookfield to build a Tower 5 was originally supposed to be an office built. We convinced the port that it's built residential on the site. So we're going to pull a million for 1,300 units of housing. Begin four project. So you got the $5 billion Tower 2, billion four, Tower 5. So it's $6.4 billion just between those two. Rental housing. There's a huge need for it. And we'll figure out how to get that done also. So it's all kinds of issues, but we're just acquiring a building downtown. No local works as an office building. The ideal of a conversion residential. So we're going to do that as well. So last question here. If you're sitting across from a 30-year-old Larry Silverstein, what advice do you have for him or her? Whatever you do, think long-term. Think in terms of doing quality projects that can have a materially beneficial impact on the community in which you believe. Don't build just for the sake of it. Don't try to build the cheapest building you can afford. Do quality stuff. Use quality architects. Build quality buildings with all the concerns, all the considerations are essential today. So our tool, it'll be a zero carbon footprint building. 100% electric, part of the electricity from photovoltaic cells, 
on the facade of the building. Payback for photovoltaic cells, 50 years. When you're 91 years of age and you're looking at a 50 year payback, not very attractive, but you got to do what's good. And when you think about it, all electric buildings are the way for the future. Got to get away from fossil fuels because of climate issues. So got to do it. So the fact that it's a 50 year payback. Okay. Fact of life, you got to live with it. So is it long term? Yes. Is it important that you build recognize the community's needs? Yes. Recognize the needs of the employees who can occupy that building? Yes. For the same one, having first class air quality, higher amounts of oxygen is good for the workers. But you can't have 100% oxygen because that's inflammable. That's not good. You make sure that your climate, the space people occupy in your buildings is the best it can be. From the same point, maximum light, maximum air, air quality, higher level of oxygen, that would all be the case. Is it expensive? Yes. But does it produce better results? Yes. And will tenants ultimately pay for it? Yes. You've got to think in a very positive fashion. You can't think about building the cheapest place you can so you can rent it for the least amount of dollars. Let's go. Well, thank you so much. I really enjoyed this. My pleasure. You've been listening to Onward, the Funrise podcast, featuring Larry Silverstein, owner developer of the New York World Trade Center and chairman of Silverstein Properties. My name is Ben Miller, CEO of Funrise. We invite you again to send your comments and questions to Onward at Funrise.com. If you like what you've heard, rate and review us on Apple Podcasts. And be sure to follow us wherever you listen to podcasts. For more information on Fundrise sponsored products, including relevant legal disclaimers, check out our show notes. Thanks again for listening, and we'll see you next episode.